Well, Bwanji, everyone, welcome to Omoyo Talks, the Omoyo podcast where we talk to interesting people about issues relating to health. And today I have the beautiful Musonda Kapena in the studio. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kim. So Musonda has a passion for environmental conservation and the promotion of indigenous knowledge systems. We're gonna get into that, what that yes. means. But towards sustainable management of forest resources, primarily here in Zambia. She is the CEO and co-founder of Namfumu Conservation Trust. And very excitingly, they are currently developing the Namfumu Eco Village, which will house an environmental education center. So doing lots of good work there. Yes, we yeah. are. So uh, Musonda, where does your passion for conservation come from? Where, where did it start? Well, thanks, Kim, and thanks for letting me speak. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, so um, my passion started when I was young. I asked my dad. Um, I grew up in Zimbabwe just after independence, so everybody in class had a white name, and I had an African name. So I kept asking him, Dad, why don't I have an, a white name? Why should everybody struggle to say Musonda? Some people would say it right, others would not say it right at all. So he said, but your name means pathfinder. It means where other people haven't yet gone, you go first and then show the others that it's okay for them to follow. So it kind of means I'm a pathfinder. That's beautiful. I get goosebumps when you say that. And you certainly are with the work that you're doing. I think I am because when I was at college, there was only five girls and we had 25 boys. So it was a very challenging environment, but I went to forestry college because that was where my passion was. In primary school, I was part of the Chongololo Club. In secondary school, I was part of the environmental club and we did a lot of excursions in the forest, in the national parks. And I, I always had a thousand and one questions like, why is this stone brown and not blue? And why is this stone blue and not brown? Then that would then help me delve into geology. But for the plants, I'd always say, why are some plants sweet smelling, others are not so nice smelling? Like the masao is, for, is um, um, pollinated by flies, so it shouldn't smell sweet, it should smell off. For the flies to be attracted to pollinate it, then it produces a lot of fruits which smell really, really nice and are full of nutrients and energy. That is so interesting. Wow. So very curious mind from the get go. Very curious. And you started Namfumu. May, tell us a little bit about the work that you do there and why you started it. Well, um, Namfumu started as a hobby in the sense that whenever I go out in the villages, which is part of my work as a forester, I would always sit with the old women and ask questions. Like, why is it you live in a round hut? Why don't you build a square one? Or why doesn't it have other designs? Then they'll explain about ventilation, about the thermal aspects of the round hut. Why is the roof so high? So through asking all these questions, I realized that the life we're living now can be richer if we go back to where we came from and find out why they did what they did then. Why do they cook with peanut butter? and groundnuts, why do we prefer to cook with oil? Yet they don't get sick and we get sick. So it's all about the critical questioning that made me realize that there was a gap in information. Mm -hmm. Most people in the cities and the urban areas would go with the flow. They would eat the pizza, they would eat the fried chicken and chips and all kinds of junk food. But when you go home or you visit an elderly household, they would always explain what the food has, why they cooked it the way they did, why you don't fry um, pumpkin leaves, for example. They have to be parboiled and salted at a certain time because they're trying to preserve the nutritional content of it. And that has antioxidants, it has um, nutrients that are often denatured when you haven't cooked it properly or you haven't dried it properly. So dried vegetables are dried in the shade. They're not solid dried. But tomato is not dried in the shade. It's dried under the sun. 
So there's a lot of science and chemistry around how the old people dry food or pre um, preserve food or how they prepare it, what they can cook today and eat tomorrow. Why don't they eat it then and there? Cassava leaves have cyanide. So if you don't cook them properly, you poison your whole family. But the olden people would know that. Yeah. And you'd ask, who taught them that? Who made the recipe for Nshima? Yeah. Or for Chikanda, for example. And is Yet there the old answer? women know. <laughs> they just know, yeah. They just know through passing on of indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. And is that what you, you mean by indigenous knowledge systems? this knowledge that has been passed on from generation to generation. That's what we mean, but to add on, it's a system. So it's, it's not one thing, it's a whole system. For example, we have a lot of forest reserves now that have been passed on untouched. They have the, the biodiversity aspect in them. They have the hydrology aspect in them. Like among the Tonga people, there are some forest areas where you are not allowed to go in, or at least it was like that in the past, because that's where the spring of water would come from. So they knew that if they opened it up to people just walking in and walking out and cutting this and cutting that, it would then disturb the spring and the water would dry out. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's why the southern province is so dry, because we no longer respect the Malende. It's actually called Malende, where the, um, the traditional leaders would give a decree, do not go there. If you go there, you get lost. So they would sh um, show it with mysticism. If you go there, you get lost. If you catch fish from there, it won't cook. But then it, it was a way of speaking so that people have respect for the area. Not really fear, but respect. So if you look at areas in northwestern province, some forests you don't go in without permission from the chief. Mm -hmm. And some of the indigenous um, knowledge systems include how to harvest, when to harvest, like the Mopani worms. Unless the chief says, now you can go out and harvest. Nobody's allowed to harvest, no matter how many Mopani worms are in the forest, you're not allowed to go there. It was a way of sustainably managing the resources. And right now, I know in Pika, Serenja areas, Chinsali, no foreigners, outsiders from that village are allowed to go and harvest things like mushroom, mopani worms, and other forest foods. Because then, if you are from Lusaka, you won't know if it's a mummy worm or a baby worm. You'll just harvest them because they look like worms. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, they harvest only specifics so that they leave the mummy worms to have babies the next year. Mm. If everything is eaten this year, then there will be nothing. Yeah. yeah. So it's a whole system around the forest, around the way of life. You're not allowed to go into the forest alone, for example, because if you get lost, who finds you? So it's always in pairs. There's a whole set of rules and traditions and cultures which together create a system. And that system is what has allowed this generation to see the forest as it is. Mm -hmm. The critical question is what are we doing to leave the forest as intact as we found it for the next generation? Malasha is coming in, um, all kinds of land use are coming in, which mean you cut down all the trees, then you start crying that there's no honey, the bees have disappeared, the water has disappeared. So when we go out as a team into the communities, the forest communities, we ask critical questions like, where has your water gone? Mm -hmm. And that remains as a discussion around the gossip mill, around the well, around the cooking stoves, like, yeah, she asked a question, where is our water? Why do we have to walk five kilometers when in the past we'd find it, dig a well here and there's water? But now there's nothing, it's dry. So where has the water gone? Would ask, where have the bees gone? The bees would be everywhere, would have honey in every other village. But now there's nothing. Where has the honey gone? That's why it's becoming more and more expensive on the market because it's becoming a scarce commodity. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting indeed. Um, so 
you've talked a little bit how these indigenous knowledge systems help protect biodiversity of the forests and the resources um, in Zambia and I guess beyond, but why is that biodiversity so important? Maybe explain to, to people who, who don't work in this field, why is it so important to preserve that? It's important because God gave us everything we need in the forest. The forest is the cradle. It also becomes the grave because when we're buried, we're buried in a coffin and where does the wood come from? The forest. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the biodiversity of a forest, it becomes our pantry. It stores food for us. Anytime you walk into a forest, you find a fruit or mushroom or an edible insect, edible oils, all that primarily comes from the forest. And whatever is in the forest is most often organic, especially if that forest isn't surrounded by commercial farms which have pesticides blowing in the wind and settling on the leaves and the fruits of forest products. It's also our medicine cabinet because whatever medications we want, we find in the forest whether it's a supplement for our nutrition or it's a medicine to cure a disease that we have, everything is in there. You may attest that um, before we had hospitals, the way we know them, everything we had was from the forest, from painkillers to vitamins to antibiotics, antivirals. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, everything that is in it is a copycat from nature. Penicillin occurred naturally. You know, and we have herbs like umun sokan soka, which is a go-to herb for traditionalists. It cures um, parasites, it cures bacteria, it cures all kinds of things. And most traditional people believe in um, curing the inside to cure the outside. So if you have a bad sore on your skin, they'll still give you something to take orally for it to go around in your bloodstream to cure the top, the topical aspect yeah. of it yeah so the forest has everything we need yet we don't recognize it we recognize it mainly as a source of fuel which is why we see a forest we see malasha mm. malasha is charcoal yeah. if the old members had a way of sustainably harvesting wood to make malasha they wouldn't cut down the whole tree they would cut branches they would prune it and oh. leave it to regenerate for next year. Interesting, I didn't know that. Wow, okay. And that's an indigenous knowledge system that we need to promote. How come we don't have any more trees in the southern regions? We have a lot more trees in the northwestern, the western, Muchinga, Wapula, because they, they were not a charcoal culture. They did not have that. They were not a farming culture that would cut down all the trees and plant. They would plant within a forest and that now is called permaculture and it's called agroforestry where you have a system of um, systematically growing your food but without cutting down all the trees. Because as soon as you cut down all the trees, you lose your hydrology. The water evaporates and you remain with nothing. Yeah, yeah. so the aspect of biodiversity is important for Namfumu because we deal in medicinal herbs, we deal in edible oils, we deal in food supplements and functional foods mm -hmm. which come from the forest. Mm -hmm. You can't replant a forest because once you cut it down, it will never ever be the same again. Mm -hmm. You lose the Mopani worms, you lose Mafulufute. Fulufute is an edible fatty insect. Ooh, I haven't tried that one. <laughs> well, I'm told it's crunchy. It's, oh, you haven't it, tried it either? Crispy. No, I haven't. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I love my vegetables. Okay, I'm the same. <laughs> yeah. So certain insects don't um, manage to live in areas that have lost certain types of trees yeah. and plants. So there's a very strong relationship between animals, insects, butterflies, soils, water, and trees. Mm -hmm. Together, that's what we call a forest. Mm -hmm. If you remove one, then you create an imbalance. And that imbalance means the mushrooms won't grow. The inswise termites, edible termites, they won't come out. And last year, for your information, one five kg container of inswa was costing over 300 kwacha in Lusaka mm -hmm. because it's become scarce. It's become scarce because we use herbicides on the soil. 
and um, those uh, herbicides go into the soil and kill off the termites mm -hmm. and the worms and the little frogs. Mm -hmm. When last did you see a butterfly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's a critical question, yeah. but that shows you that we used to have dragonflies, ladybirds, yeah. butterflies, but, but we don't see them anymore. I love how you say that the forest is a system, that everything has its place, everything has a purpose. If it is alive, if it is there, it has a purpose yes. that integrates with everything else. We can't just see everything as an individual. It, it all comes together yes. um, for that forest to, to flourish. When I first came to, to Zambia many, many years ago, to kind of get to know the herbs better. I did a course with a local herbalist, which yes. was very interesting, just to, to get to know the different herbs, the roots, the trees, and what was available. And one of the things he, he said to me was that, you know, this knowledge with uh, traditional herbal medicine has been passed on generation to generation, and it was seen as sacred knowledge. Really? Yes. And... Um, which is beautiful how it passed on, but he, he said that the younger generation now don't have as keen of an interest in it. I guess they're moving to the big cities and, and so on. Yes. And because of that, some of this information is being lost as the traditional healers uh, become elderly and, and, and pass on, you know. What is your, maybe comment on that? How, how can we preserve some of this knowledge? How can we ensure that it gets passed on? And perhaps what work are you doing in this area? Well, it's a, it's a wasting resource and, and that's sad because as I said in the beginning, each time we go to the village, we try to sit with the old people and they feel really important and they start talking and they share their stories and they sing us the songs. So in Zambian tradition, as it is in African tradition, we're not a written culture, we're an oral culture. We sing, every song we sing has a meaning, like um, it's almost raining soon, so you hear all the children start singing, you know, like you're calling upon the rain to come so that we play with the rain and we see all the insects that come with the rain. We smell the rain off the soil. We, it's a simple song with just two or three lines of repetitive yeah. rhythmic singing, but it speaks about the joy that comes with the rain. Beautiful. Beautiful. So through song and through storytelling, and also if you have a grandmother or an elderly relative, sit with them and ask them critical questions like, you never had pizza, what would you eat? They'll tell you all the snacks and crickets and insects and everything that they would find from the forest. So the difference that we have now is that I'm a herbalist. They call me a bougie herbalist because I've taken interest and I've done some studies with them, with some renowned herbal um, men and women. You need to walk the soil. You need to feel the intimacy with the forest, with the earth, or else you won't be able to decipher one plant from the other. And that's the difference between poisoning somebody with what you think is a herb and healing them with what is the herb. There are simple herbs like mango leaves, guava leaves, um, tomato leaves. There's all kinds of foods which we've underutilized. But if we think of green tea, I can make you a green tea from citrus leaves and mango leaves, mm -hmm. and it will give you the energy and the refreshment that you need. We don't always have to buy it out of a shop at exorbitant prices. I've taught my son, I've taught a few of the young people to say, if you want green tea or you feel you have a little cough, take the lemon, don't throw anything away from the lemon, chop it up, put it in hot water, take the leaves and mix that up, put a bit of honey and drink it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, but what if it's poison? So it's about talking. The lemon you take as lemon juice won't poison you. Mm -hmm. The seeds of the lemon are part of the lemon. So it's about constantly talking to the young people. Some young people we've spoken to say, why don't you have an app to show that this is a herb and this is the way you make it? It's hard to explain that you can't easily make an app out of everything. Unless you've walked the forest, then you'll know the herbs because then you feel them. 
there's a form of energy around walking in a forest or just sitting under the shade. You get a different energy sitting in the sun mm -hmm. and you have a different energy sitting in the shade. It's unexplainable. Mm -hmm. But the other important thing we noticed is that most of the village women and men who know about herbs and are young, like below the age of 30, are those that were AIDS orphans in the past and they were brought up in cities but had to go back to the village because one or both of their parents passed away. So they were now positioned to work with their grandmothers and the elderly people in the village. Interesting. So they would take walks with their grandmothers. They would take walks with their aunties and uncles and so on. And they would be asked, because the elderly people don't have the strength to dig for a root or to climb up a tree to get the fresh leaves. So the young ones would do that and they never forget. That's what we call experiential learning. Unless you've experienced it, walked through it, done it, pounded the roots, prepared the potash, you won't be able to know it from an app because then it will just be theory and academic knowledge. But if we take that person who's washed the app into the forest, they might even be bitten by a snake because they don't know how to navigate themselves. They don't know how to smell. When you walk the forest, you need to use all your senses at the same time. What smells like a fruit might be a lethal um, venomous snake. What smells like quick, uh, cooking potatoes may be a tree that will definitely give you itch itching and all that. So you need to smell, to see, to hear, to touch, sometimes to taste as well. That's how come you can tell the difference between similar plants you'll know that this I can eat, this I can't eat. And in Bemba, there's the monkey orange, there's the type that you eat, it's sweet, you can make juice from it. Then there's what they call ifi nangwa, like nothing, mm -hmm. that you can't eat. And they follow, they follow the monkeys. If the monkeys eat it, it's good for humans as well. If the monkeys stay away from it, then it's not good for the humans. Oh, so wonderful. it's about feeling and yeah. knowing, yeah. Sounds incredible. Um, I, I do feel though what I've seen here in Zambia, although it seems like because our lives are changing and we're leading these very modern lives that uh, a lot of people don't get to experience what you were just talking about, walking in the forest with the grandmother and learning, you know. Um, but yet I find because there is such a rich tradition with using herbs, Zambians generally are very open to using herbs and trying herbs for healing. Um, and often, I would say, probably try that before going to conventional medicines and hospitals and so on. I is that continuing or are you still seeing that? Um, I think it's continuing at a slow pace because we've changed our ideologies. Some people believe everything from the village is bad. It is witchcraft, it is demonic. Everything in town is good, it is rich, it is true. But the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. In the sense that when we get married as Zambian women, we get married first traditionally, where his parents will come to my parents and ask for my hand in marriage. It's a whole indigenous system of getting the plate and giving the symbol and that's, that's who we are. And we call that Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. We are Ubuntu before we are anything else. Then they say, oh, but you have to go to the church. Oh, you have to go to the civic center and register the marriage. So the core is the tradition. But you found out that some people, some family lines have forsaken their traditions, including their names. So as soon as somebody is calling out to me, Musonda, they are reminding me that I am Ubuntu. They remind me, and it's said in a certain way that I will answer. And I can't say, yeah, I would have to say ma if it's a woman or ta if it's a man as a form of respect. So in most of our young households, you'd um, expose them to herbs and they go Googling for it and they're like, but it's not on the app, it's not on the internet, so it's poison. Would we constantly educate. So our main ethos is environmental education in the sense that most people don't get this education at school. 
But those that do are able to learn chemistry in school and realize that it's chemistry that we use when we're cooking. You can't mix um, um, lemon and chili, for example. You choke on it because it creates a chemical that your system rejects. But you can mix tomato and onion. Everybody cooks with tomato and onion. You can mix garlic with ginger. You can't mix certain things. So what we're doing is educating the younger couples, the children. We're trying to get into doing excursions where we take out a class of kids for a weekend and we have a campfire in the night and provide employment to the older people to come and tell their stories because I won't tell it as well as they will. They may say it in the local language. Most of our children, unfortunately, don't. They may have the name Musonda, but they can't speak Bemba mm -hmm. because in the household, all they speak is English and we think it's the in thing. But it's eroding our tradition, it's eroding our culture. It's funny that um, a lot of couples embrace Chinese medicine, Indian medicine, but they reject their own indigenous knowledge and medicines. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. The only difference is that culturally, the Chinese has preserved their culture and they've marketed their indigenous knowledge where they tell you ginseng is working for this and this weed is working for that. As soon as we go to our youths and tell them this weed is food, they're like, I'm not a cow. I'm like, but you just ate the same weed in that food which was named something else, but because it's not named in your language, you've embraced it. So the critical question for all of us, including some elders, is who are we? Who are you? Because Ubuntu speaks about I am because you are and then we are. We are a collective energy. Mm -hmm. We are a collective people that rely on each other. Beautiful. I love that. <laughs> That's amazing, Musonda. Maybe now tell us a little bit about some of the wonderful things, um, herbs, fruits that we can find in Zambian forests and how people can use them. Wow, that will take a day and oh, a half. Choose the most interesting, famous, well, your favorite perhaps. My favorite is musakese. Uh -huh. It's monkey bread. Okay. And in the village, it's eaten by cows okay. and it's eaten by people, especially women. We took it for analysis and found that it has a very high content of carbohydrates, good carbohydrates, it has good fiber, it has vitamin C, it has zinc, and it has um, sugars. So when you're eating it, you don't need to add any sweetener because it's already quite sweet. So it's a healthy, aromatic um, bread. And I know you brought some today with yes. you in powder form. Yes. So we have some here. Um, I've actually, I've never tasted it. I know my you kids should. eat it you when should. they find it. So I'm actually mm -hmm. going to taste this. But how would people use this powder? Um, we powdered it because that's how the communities use it. So yeah. you could add it to your porridge, to your oatmeal. Okay. You could add it to plain yogurt. And it works really, really well. You could make mm. um, vitumbuas, fritters from it. You can make cookies with it. We've engaged a chef. His name is Robert. And he's just experimenting with it. Okay. It doesn't have as much uh, gluten as flour does. So if you're mixing it with a flour product, you need to balance it out. Normally, it's a ratio of one cup of msekese to two cups of flour. Then it binds properly and the aroma is just really nice. It has a bit of a sour taste. That's a vitamin C. That's a vitamin C. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of baobab. Not quite as sour, yeah. but just a, a hint of it. And yeah. it has a nutty flavor yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, very interesting. So it's really healthy, and they call it monkey bread because when monkeys find a tree of msekese, they'll chew up all the pods and throw out the seeds, yeah. and that's how the seeds are often dispersed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'd encourage people to plant them, msekese. It's, it's not very difficult to plant. It's a bean tree. It uh, grows as a shrub. So it's not too high for you to like harvest. Yeah. And you brought one more thing here with you. Tell us a little about, about this. What is this? The Mugwilian tea is one of my best because it actually works against high blood pressure. 
So it has for the people potassium. who don't know it, it's a fruit, right? It's a fruit that predominantly grows around the Kalahari sands. So you find it quite often um, in southern province, a little bit on the plateau, but also in the valley areas too. Um, it's, a, it's, it's like amla, which you find the Indian amla, but this one we're calling the African amla. Okay. Yeah. And it's a little bit more sour than the sekese. Okay. I'm gonna and try. it's nutty and yeah. And uh, wh why should people take this? What, what's the benefit of this? This has benefits for children, for men, for women. Um, it's a food. It replaces the mm. nutrients and micro minerals that you don't have in your system. It, it also kind of helps with hormonal balancing for menopause women. So you find that the people buying it a lot are the premenopause and menopause women. And it's very ple pleasant tasting as well. It is pleasant tasting. <laughs> how much of it should you be taking? So a menopausal woman, how, how much should they take a day of this? Depending on their palate, it's an acquired taste. So you, you can take a tablespoon in your yogurt in the morning or in your porridge and another one in the evening. So it becomes part of your food. It doesn't become like a medicine where you have to take it two, three times a day. Yeah. Okay. Some women take more of it, but then it shows that they may have had a lot of children and may have osteoporosis. So their system is saying, I want more of that. I want more of that. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we don't have diets. We have cravings. So if I crave for msekese or for the leaves, the leaves of the msekese tree make a perfect green tea because it's rich in the vitamin C. So the pregnant women love it. They chew it off like a cow because it gives them the instant relief of their craving. Yeah. So these are what we would call, I guess, superfoods or functional foods. Functional foods yeah. Yes. So it's nothing to be afraid of. It's, uh, it, you eat it as a normal food. It just has beautiful properties and nutrition. And it's organic. And it it's doesn't organic. have any pesticides, herbicides in it. Yeah. So what, I mean, you've, you've um, told us so many beautiful stories uh, and uh, kind of the importance of, of these uh, indigenous knowledge systems in order to preserve or, or conserve our, our forests and resources here in Zambia. Yet, you know, life is changing. And as I said earlier, a lot of people are moving to the cities, are forgetting some yeah. of this indigenous knowledge. Um, and that's, of course, affecting the forests. And what do you think the future is? H how does the future look? And what needs to happen now, now in order for us to conserve our forests here in Zambia? Um, I'm a strong believer that if you don't know where you're going, stop and look back. The answers might be behind you. You might have missed something. So some of the critical questions are that why is it that we have old people then we don't have young people? The young people are dying quicker than the older people. So it's imperative to ask the older generations what they did right that we're doing wrong. Is it our way of life? Is it our diet? Is it the elements that we're exposed to? When we had COVID, a lot of people from the village were like, COVID is a town disease. In a way, I agree with their logic because they said, when we come, when the villagers come to town, they get flus, they get all kinds of sinus reactions because there's carbon in the air, there's all these pollutants around. When they go back and drink their water from the well or from the river, they don't have those problems. So the future for Zambia, the population, the people, the black in the Zambian flag, is that we need to respect our culture. What did the elders do right that we're doing wrong? What can we learn from them? Because they are old. The fact that we can talk to them means they're alive and they're there. And they have a wealth of information for every problem. They know about marriages. They know about childbirth. They know about how to keep your family healthy. They'll even tell you each time you cook Nshima, wash your cooking stick immediately. Because they know if you leave it, Nshima is carbohydrate, and that's the easiest medium for bacteria to grow on. You don't want an infected cooking stick, and then it gives the whole household diarrhea. But it's such a simple thing that we don't think beyond why they were doing that. They often say, um, always, um, don't put salt when you're eating at the table. 
because they know that it gives you all kinds of hypertensive complications and all. So sometimes, no matter how they say it, they may say it in a reprimanding way, like, why are you doing that? You don't do that. We don't do that. Most elders don't say I, because the individual doesn't exist in our culture. What exists is the we, mm -hmm. the Ubuntu. Yeah. So it's important that we have forums, you invite older people, ask them at their own pace. You need a lot of patience, by the way, because some old people have dementia. So they'll say the same thing over and over again. Or sometimes they'll fail to reboot the thought and they'll say it as if they're saying it for the first time. But we are younger, so it's important for our generation to know so that as we sit with our children, we pass it on. When our children are at school, they'll talk about it like, look, I've come with a cracker, um, you know, those snacks. Yeah. And my son actually did that. And the friends were like, but your crackers don't taste like the crackers we buy in the shops. Then he's like, yeah, my mom actually made it with Msekesi and we have Msekesi at home. Suddenly I had parents calling me like, what has your son been telling my son about Msekesi? I'm like, yeah, we're selling some and if you want some, I could show you some recipes and all that. So it's about passing it on. And as Zambians, we love gossip. So gossip is the fastest way of spreading good information. A lot of women will sit and say, hey, have you heard that there's Msekesi? Do you think Msekesi is good? But if you send out something positive through the gossip mill, all the women will know. In the village, the best way to call a meeting is to just plant a gossip seed, like somebody is coming and she says she's bringing some cake made of msekese. They'll all be like, can you make cake from msekese? That tree that we see in the forest can make cake. By the end of the day, the meeting is full of women and they're like, show us the cake. And we're like, yeah, this is the msekese, this is the powder. Let's make cake together. And they're like, Beautiful. what? Yeah. We can make cake and vitumbua and scones yeah. from the same things we've taken for granted. Beautiful. So in the communities, they take the herbs for granted. In town, we don't know about them. So the secret is to bring and promote more of the traditional foods, the forest foods. Um, we try to make sweets, actually, with them, sekese. And the flavor is different. So for sweet lovers, you could still have msekese. For people who are diabetic, they don't want any added sugar, they could still use it and still benefit from the um, goodness of it. But it's about talking, 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 taking advantage that we have an oral culture. So the more we talk, the more we educate each other. If we put it in books and recipe books, it will only reach a certain fraction of the community, but most of them talk it through. They don't read it through, they talk it through. And now there's TikTok, so some of the plans are how do we use social media where everybody will think it's a joke, but will learn something mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, for people who are listening or watching this and, and want to get involved, perhaps learn more, What's the best way to get involved or get in touch with you? The best way is that we're on Facebook, but also I think you'll have my number soon. You could call in and we talk, meet, make plans, go out into the community. In this case, the community isn't only the forest community, it's the high residential areas, the um, everybody. Everybody that makes a community can benefit from this because everybody eats every day. So what we need, especially as health, is communicating. How else do we communicate? How do we communicate to older people? How do we communicate to the men? The men will know about the knowledge, but they feel shy to talk about it to their wives, which is why most men say I'm, the best food is the food my mommy used to cook, because they remember that food, but they haven't introduced it into the home. The women are the ones that introduce all kinds of foods into the households yeah mm -hmm. so you could help by asking questions asking for clarifications um, inviting us for talks like this volunteering to come with us into the field to actually see for you and your family and friends or for schools or for church groupings we are here to share the information our asset is what we have learned and continue to learn is what we give out mm -hmm. yeah 
Beautiful, Musonda. And uh, certainly, Musonda, you are a pathfinder, absolutely. I think it's extraordinary the work that you're doing with um, Namfumu. Um, and I wish you all the best, hey? And we'll make sure that we put all your information in the, the show notes so people can get a hold of you and, and also learn more about what you do. So thank you so much for coming through thank today. You. It has been an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed it. And everybody drink as much water as you can. It's really hot. Hydration is important. Yeah, it's hot. We're yeah. in October at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll sing Infula Isaisa when the rain comes. Oh. Wonderful. I look forward to hearing that. (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, I hope that you found the show interesting. I found it immensely interesting. And uh, please um, make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Until then, take care.